After we've done the 7600 and 7900X, it's time to cover the mid-range, the 7700X. We have game benchmarks, synthetics, actual software and an army of comparison charts. But before we get to that, let's see where this thing fits in. On spec we are looking at an 8 core 16 thread CPU burning at 105 watts TDP. <laughs> Okay. The base clock is set to be at 4.5 GHz and it should be boosting at up to 5.4 GHz and with a combined L2 and L3 cache of about 40 MB. This positions it not that far away from its smaller 7600X 6 core 12 thread counterpart but pretty far away from the 12 core 24 thread 7900X. Core counts ignored for a second, it's kinda weird to see that the base clock loses 200 MHz while going from a Ryzen 5 to a Ryzen Ryzen 7 while the max boost clock wins 100. I kinda expected a A or B thing but not uh, both. Comparing this year's lineup to Ryzen 5000 isn't as straightforward as for the other chips. While each one got an older version upon release, the 5700X wasn't present back then. The 5700 was actually released just a few months ago on April 4th 2020. The Ryzen 7 that got released on the original 5000 lineup back then was the 5800X. This doesn't really make things uncomparable, no, lining up a 5800X versus a 7700X makes as much sense as for any other chip. 700 MHz on the base clock, plus 700 on the boost, and 8 MB of additional L2 and L3 cache. However, this does make the generational increase a bit smaller compared to any other Ryzen 7000 CPU. If you would compare a 5700X versus a 7700X, we would be back to gaining at least a full GHz on the base clock. Another thing that makes things a bit harder to compare is the pricing. Because if you would look up the original MSRP pricing of a 5700 X, you would find out that it would be at 299, whereas the 7700X is sitting at a whopping 400. And yes, this seems like a huge price increase, however, the 5700X was released so late into the architecture that AMD was just trying to win the, the last few bucks before the printer was sold off to eBay and the new shiny one for Ryzen 7000 could start printing them new cash. Comparing the original release lineup makes a lot more sense here, with a 450 50 MSRP price tag, the new Ryzen 7 dropped by $50, which kinda makes sense because it's not a 7800X, it's a 7700X. So far so good, expectations are set, let's get to the benchmark. For our testing of every Ryzen 7000, we used an X670E Gigabyte ARS Master. The memory in use are two sticks of 16GB G-Skill Trident Z5 Neo DDR5 running at 6000MHz CL30. For our Ryzen 5000 comparison, we used an Asus X570 Tough Gaming Plus motherboard. However, as the last generation was a DDR4 only platform, we decided to use two 16 gig sticks of Thermaltake Tough RAM at 3600MHz CL18. For Intel, however, we decided to normalize it as much as possible. For these CPUs, we used an ASRock Z690 Taichi in combination with the same Trident Z5 memory. Here, just keep in mind that the G-Scale memory has been specifically made for AMD, hence there is an Expo profile, but no XMP profile. However, we made sure to manually set them to the same speed to average both platforms out to the fullest extent that possible. For the rest, we used a bunch of Samsung 980 Pros in combination with a Be Quiet Dark Power 1200 watt power supply and to make sure that the CPU is the main thing that we will measure, we used a RTX 3090 Ti all in 1080p. And to fully disclose everything, all of our benchmarks have been performed with all BIOS settings reset to default and then setting the correct RAM speed with Expo or DOCP or manually setting them. And then furthermore, Intel CPUs had all of their velocity boosts and, and boost features and, and here and there active, so they were able to boost to whatever they are capable of. For our Ryzen 5000, we did two runs, once with only DOCP enabled and another one with DOCP and PBO. All of our results were then created by averaging three runs. And just as it was for our Ryzen 7 600X or 7 900X, we had to endure the crushing realization that no matter what we did to any PBO setting, it just lowered our score. And this is the reason why Ryzen 5000 benchmarks are separated into PBO enabled and PBO disabled runs, while all of our Ryzen 7000s just got only an Expo run where PBO was specifically disabled altogether. Okay, with that out of the way, 
let's get to it. In CPU-Z, we saw that Intel is still having the upper hand. In single thread workloads, we got 772 points compared to the 12700 case 783. The old core score produced 7,797 points, again quite a bit behind the 9,150 points from the i7. Though the multi-score isn't really anything unexpected as the i7 comes with 20 threads while the 7700X only has 16. Comparing old versus new gen, we are looking at a 23% increase in single and 37% increase in all core performance. Over on Cinebench R23, however, things change. With a single thread score of 1979, the 7700X perfectly closed the gap, creating that beautiful line of only Ryzen 7000s, followed by only Intel 12th gen. Compared to the previous generation's 5700X, we are looking at an uplift of roughly 32%. In all core, the 7700X managed to climb pretty high up there, at 19,729 points, roughly 56% in front of the last generation and 13% behind the i7. In 3D Mark Times by the overall system score turned out to be 19,951, about 9% higher than the 5700X. In CPU only score, the gap became a lot bigger, 45%. Compared to the i7, we are looking at a 2 and 15% decrease. In 3D Mark CPU profile test, we saw pretty much the same thing that happened with the 7 600X, while the 7700X was able to be among the very best from the first thread on, it came to a very sudden hold as it maxed out at 16 threads, whereas the i7 12700K could go on a bit longer thanks to its 20 threads. Interesting to see, however, here is the comparison between a 7600 and a 7700X. While the score for a single thread and two threads are clearly on the 7700X's side, using four threads turned out to be in the 7600X's favor and quite heavily at that. Using 8 threads then turned the tables again in favor of the 7700X and from here it's back to normal as the thread count on the 7600X just can't keep up. Coming to some actual software, rendering an image in Corona took 70 seconds for the 7700X, 21 seconds less than the 7600X and 23 more than the 7900X. Compared to previous generation, we are looking at a 30% uplift and compared to the i7, a 4% decrease. Rendering out a 2 minutes timeline in Premiere Pro using YouTube 4K preset, it took 215 seconds, 35% less than it took the 5700X and 4% more compared to the 12700K. Transcoding the same file into H265 took a total of 333 seconds, giving us a 198 second advantage over the 5700X and yay, for once it got us a 11% increase over the 12700K. Nice. Rendering out a BMW Blender took 117 seconds, 68 seconds quicker than a 5700X, but 17 seconds slower compared to an i7. Coming to game benchmarks, in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we found, yeah, pretty much nothing. At 260 FPS, the 7700, 7900 and 7950X all had the exact same result. The only outlier is the 7600X at 7 FPS average less. And topping all of them is still the 5800X 3D. Compared to last gen, we are looking at a roughly 37% increase and a 15% increase compared to an i7. In Far Cry 6, the results are surprisingly bad compared to other Ryzen 7000 chips. With an average FPS counter of 179, it is still better than any of Intel's 12 gen chip. However, it scored significantly behind every other Ryzen 7000 chip. In Metro Exodus, this was corrected again with the 7700X landing on the second spot behind the 7600X. And coming to the last benchmark and AMD's favorite, Formula 1. With 435 FPS on average, it landed on the second spot again. And while doing so, it was 33% ahead of the i7. So far so good. Now with all of those results, let's make some head-to-head -head comparison. Comparing the new 7700X to the last 5700X, we can see that there are some huge generational increments that have been made. In everything from CPU-Z to Corona, the 7700X was miles ahead with the lowest increment being 9.18% and the biggest one being Cinebench R23 Multi 
at 56%. Counting all of those together, we are looking at a 34% generational increase in performance. Looking at only the software side, it's a bit less, at 33%, but gaming-wise, it is again 39%. We also got an average gaming increase of 36%, and this one then includes the mins and the max. However, I do like to exclude those as a single hiccup can decrease this goal dramatically, or increase it in fact, as we can see here with a 1.99% decrement in minimum FPS in Far Cry 6. Comparing Intel's still current generation 12700K to the 7700X reveals a very troubling picture. Pretty much the same one we've got with the 7600X versus the 12600X. The 7700X is far better at gaming and the 12700K is a lot better at working. Averaging the scores, we can see that the 7700X wins at about 20% over the 12700K as far as Far Cry, Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Metro Exodus and of course Formula 1 are concerned. If however the main focus is working, it's a different picture. There the 12700K wins with a 3% performance increase. However, this makes sense. While single core performance is definitely on the 7700X side with a 5% increase in Cinebench, the 20 threats that the 12700K comes with are just not reachable. Just look at 3 d Mark CPU profile test. While the 7700X was clearly ahead, of this game for 1, 2, 4 and 8 threads, the moment we got to 16, the 12700K just took over. And that difference got a lot bigger once we rammed all of them in with 20 versus 16 threads. The only outlier here is the 16 thread score, where I expect that the result still being on AMD's side, as the 7700X does in fact have exactly 16 threads, but no. The whole trend then continues on for Corona, Premiere Pro and Blender, but not Handbrake, for whatever reason. So comparing a 12700K to a 7700X paints exactly the same picture as for the 12600K versus 7600X. Right now, for the lower tier chips, AMD is the choice for gaming, but Intel is still better at workload. Let's have a quick glance at the 7700X versus the smaller 7600X. For games, we are looking at an average increase of 10.57%. But not really. Take away the maximum and minimum values, and the difference becomes small enough that Excel just rounds it down to zero. For real work, however, we can clearly see a difference, but only for multi-threaded workloads. While both Cinebench and CPU-Z single thread hovered at around 1%, 3D Mark found the biggest difference of 3% using just a single thread. But count in the higher thread workloads and 16 versus 12 thread difference becomes quite substantial, averaging at around 16%. So where does all of this leave us? Well, honestly, I don't believe the 7700X is in a very good position. Let's say you are a gamer and you are looking for a good bang for the buck gaming CPU. Choosing a 7700X instead of a 7600X will give you a whopping 0% increase. Sure, you might win a couple of hiccups here and there, but still nothing significant enough to make you feel a difference between the two chips. Now let's say you are a worker and you want to render, edit, create 3D stuff, whatever. Well, going for a 7700X instead of a 7600X doesn't make sense it makes 16% sense. However, here comes the 7900X, which, although the total average seems to be quite low at plus 19%, it is actually a lot bigger, because once you ignore single thread performance, you can, and you fully utilize the whole chip, we are actually looking at way higher numbers. And that's pretty much where the 7700X sits, in, in our opinion. The 7600X is clearly the choice for gaming, because we are using a 3090 Ti for benchmarks and use something more appropriate like a 3080, and the differences will become practically zero. So from a gaming standpoint, the 7700X, it doesn't really make any sense at all. And if you're looking for a working CPU, the 7700X doesn't really make any sense either, because the uplift of going for a 7900X is so much bigger that waiting until you have the $150 extra to spend makes a lot of sense. And the same thing applies if you throw in the 12700K. From a gaming standpoint, sure, the 7700X beats it without a sweat, but so does the 7600X. So why not save the 150 bucks? And software-wise, it 
it loses by up to 3%. So why not wait and go for the real monster instead in case of harder workloads? So yeah, that's pretty much our opinion. It's, it's a simple don't. If you are doing purely gaming, go for a 7600X. If you are doing a lot of work, go for a 7900X. If you are doing both, still go for the 7900X. A, a change in gaming performance won't really be noticeable at all, but you will definitely feel it in working. That being said, we also did a whole bunch of eco mode. You know, the step where you tell your CPU that it's now a 65 watt CPU instead of a 105, and it will just respond with a weird sounding yes. Yeah. By default, our 7700X was burning about 135 watts through the socket. And after performing all of that PPT, TDC and EDC voodoo stuff, it came down to 90 watts on the package, 69 of which came from the core. Boosting wise, we saw some things change. Doing a single thread run in Cinebench lets both modes boost up to 5.55 GHz, which is still a 150 MHz above spec, which is nice. And all core boosts, however, saw a little decline. 5.1 GHz in Cinebench without any eco mode, and then 4.95 GHz with the TDP set to 65 watts. So far, so good. With a 150 MHz boost clock reduction, you would expect the overall performance to decline, right? <laughs> no. We saw the same random stuff we saw on the 7600X. While CPU Z won some minuscule victories, Cinebench Multi won a couple of percents. For 3D Mark CPU profile, it's the same misery. One thread lost, and so did two, but four and eight won. Just to see both 16s then uh, win again, it's okay. For Corona Premiere Pro Handbrake and Blender, we saw the same type of decline between 1 and 6%. However, for gaming, it's it was a complete what the f again. For Far Cry Average Min Max, Metro Average Min Max, Formula 1 Average and Max, all of these were able to score between a tiny bit and a whole lot more thanks to the limit of the CPU now being 65 watts. The only outliner here is Shadow of the Tomb Raider and minimum FPS for Formula 1. However, just to give you some context, for Tomb Raider it's 260 FPS versus 256. Yeah, that's 1.5% decrease, but don't tell me you can see that or that the monitor is even able to reproduce it. And for Formula 1, it's even more ridiculous. The 7700X got a minimum FPS of 323, and the 7700X with two broken legs scored 316. And once you calculate everything together, you saved 46 watts of total package power for the absolute misery of losing so much performance that Excel rounds it down to 0%. What a devastating blow. So again, a very interesting topic as a whole needs to be discovered a lot more and I'm sure that this will be extremely useful for people that want to maximize their performance to power rating, especially now where electricity becomes so much more expensive. But for today, this should be it about the 7700X. I hope this was what you were looking for and if you haven't seen our other Ryzen 7000 coverages yet, here they are. On a side note, I didn't talk much about thermal issues, which was on purpose, because there will be a second video coming where we'll go over the type of cooler you need, but to give you some numbers right here and now, while forcing it to boost to 138 watts package, um, a Noxia NHD15 was able to keep it at 95.6 in a 25 degree C room. Great times are ahead of us. But for now, I hope you enjoyed it and also a big thank you to AMD and all the people in between that made it possible so that we could cover this little puppy here today. Thank you for watching and hope to see you in the next one. Bye bye.